Welcome, folks, to the Halloween Spooktacular presented by NCCT. Please note the emergency exits in the back and the right of the room where you enter. Tonight, we have prepared a variety of spooky acts for your viewing pleasure. So please sit back and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen and rascals, I have some disturbing news. Our next comedian, well, I wouldn't dare laugh at him. Uh, in fact, I think he may do all the laughing himself. Whatever you do, just try not to catch his attention. It does not seem to go well. Um, can someone get the bat signal ready, just in case? Okay, well, all right, please welcome Dakota Paris as the Joker. I know, not what you're expecting, and I humbly apologize. But I did bring an extra special guest. I brought him himself from Gotham City. The best I can do at a short time, and trust me, a good kick to my teeth is less than expected. What's going on here? I don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. <laughs> well, allow me to help you fast. I've written a very, very special thing just for the good people of this city. I don't know what to call it. Your traffic is a warrant. <clears throat> doing? What you're doing is what any sane man in your position would do. <laughs> you're going mad. I, I don't remember what's going on. You don't remember? Oh, I wouldn't do that. Remembering is dangerous, and I find the past such a worrying, anxious place. The past tense, as I call it myself. And a bit of a tough crowd, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Memories, oh, they're always so treacherous. One moment you're lost in a carnival of delight, with pony and childhood aroma, the flashing neon of puberty, and all the sentimental candy, blah, 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 blah. The next, it leads you somewhere. Don't want to go somewhere dark and cold, filled with the damn ambiguous shapes of things you hoped were forgotten. But memories, alas, can be vile, repulsive little brutes, like children, I suppose. <laughs> but we can't live without them. Memories are what our reason is based upon. If we can't face them, will we deny reason itself? Although, why not? We aren't contractually tied down to anything. I mean, there's no sanity clause, after all. So you find yourself locked into an unpleasant train of thought, headed for places where the screaming is unbearable. Remember, there's always madness, and madness, as you know, is the emergency basis. <laughs> but you can just step outside and close the door on those dreadful things that happen. You can lock them away forever. Oh, I know, I know, you're confused, you're frightened. I mean, who wouldn't be? You're all in one heck of a situation. But you know, life is a bowl of cherries, and this is this. I want you all, I want you all to remember this. When the world is full of scare, and every headline screams of despair, and you think life is vile and cruel, 
then there are certain things which I do, which I shall pass along to you, that are always guaranteed to make me smile. Go loony as a light bulb, batter bugs, or simply loony sometimes. You could fall more sugar up for all I care. When life is swell as a padded cell, it'll chase those blues away. You can trade your gloom for a rubber room and injections twice a day. <laughs> Don't really know, but okay. Go loony like an acid casualty or marooning or like one of those preachers on TV. Crap, it's shit a white nut. When the human race is an, wears an anxious face, Anxious, I know. <laughs> it won't worry you. You can smile and nod instead. When you're a loony, then you just don't give a fig. Man's so puny, and the world is so big. If you hurt inside, you can get certified by your doctor today. <laughs> and if life, and if life should treat you badly, then you should not get even. You. You should just get mad instead. <laughs> Our next performance comes from Dracula the Musical. As Jonathan Harker agonizes over the promise he has made to his love Mina, a promise that should her soul darken beyond saving, that he will kill her. Here to sing before the summer ends is Kenny Hartling. His performance will be followed by Grace Gunn singing Kiss of the Spider Woman. Although between you and me, this is one kiss that may be less romantic and more along the lines of completely terrifying. <laughs>
strange man wandered in from the cold and is demanding to speak with all of you, um, and I'm not going to be the one to tell him no. So please welcome to the stage Roy Sillings. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I have been and am. Uh, but why would you say that I am mad? The, the disease had height and strength and, and sharpened my senses, had not dulled them. Above all, was the sense of hearing acute. I heard many things in the earth and in the heaven. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Uh, Hearken and. <clears throat> Attend while I tell you how calm I can be with a whole story. Uh, is it possible to say when first the idea entered my brain? Uh, it, uh, but once conceived, it uh, haunted me day and night. Oh, there was none. none. Uh, I uh, love the old man. <laughs> uh, his. Uh, I love the old man. Uh, he had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. Uh, uh, for his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, very gradually, I, uh, I made up my mind to uh, take the life of the old man and uh, uh, rid myself thus of the eye forever. Uh, uh, now, this is the point. You fancy me mad. 
madmen who know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how, how wisely I proceeded well, with what uh, foresight, oh, what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week uh, before I killed him. <laughs> uh, and every night, uh, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently, and put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And um, then I thrust in my head. <laughs> you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly. And uh, uh, <clears throat> it took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening. <laughs> Would a madman been as wise as that? <laughs> and then, when my head was well in, I undid the lantern cautiously, uh, oh so cautiously, cautiously, because the hinges creaked. I opened it just so much that a single ray, like the, uh, like a single ray, fell upon the vulture eye. <laughs> and this I did for seven long nights, every night, just at midnight. <sighs> but the eye I found always closed, and so I could not do the work. <laughs> for it was not the old man that vexed me, but his evil eye. <laughs> um, and every morning, when the day broke, I went uh, boldly into the chamber and spoke uh, courageously to him, uh, <laughs> uh, asking him how he had passed the night. Uh, so you see, uh, he would have been a very, very profound old man indeed uh, to have suspected that every night at 12 I looked in upon him as he slept. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, and on the eighth night, I was particularly cautious in opening the door. A clock, um, a watcher's minute hand moves more slowly than did mine. Mm -hmm. uh, never before that night had I felt the extent of my own power, of my sagacity. I could scarcely believe my feelings of triumph. Uh, to think, there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds and thoughts. I, uh, I fairly chuckled at the idea. <laughs> uh, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved suddenly as if startled. Uh, now, you may think I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with a thick darkness, so I knew he could not see the opening of the door. Uh, uh, and I kept pushing it off steadily, steadily. And I had my head in the room and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastenings, and the old man sprang up in the bed, uh, shouting, who's there, who's there? Uh, well, uh, I kept uh, quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. Uh, and, and in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down in the bed. Uh, he was still sitting up in the bed, listening. Uh, just as I had done, night after night, hearkening to the clicking beetles, the death watches ticking in the wall. Uh, uh, presently, I heard a, a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. Uh, it was not the groan of pain or grief. <laughs> oh, no. It was a low, stifled 
sound that arises from the bottom of a soul when overcharged with awe. <laughs> I knew the sound well many a night, just at midnight, while all the world slept, as it welled up from my own bosom, uh, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. Uh, uh, presently, uh, uh, I say I, I knew the feeling well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I had laughed as far. Uh. <laughs> I, I knew he had been uh, lying awake ever since the first slight noise. <laughs> Uh, his fears had ever since been growing upon him. He'd been trying to uh, fancy them causeless, uh, but could not. He had been saying to himself, <laughs> it is only uh, the wind in the chimney. It's only a mouse crossing the floor. <laughs> or uh, it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. <laughs> but all in vain. <laughs> all in vain. Because death, uh, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. <laughs> and it was the mournful influence of the unforeseen shadow that it caused him to feel, although not seen or heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. After waiting a long time without hearing him uh, lie down, I resolved to open the lantern, to open a, a, a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I opened it, uh, you cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray uh, like the thread of the spider, uh, shot from out the crevice and uh, fell full upon the vulture eye. Uh, it was open, wide, wide open, uh, and I grew furious gaze. I gazed upon it. The uh, of the senses. <laughs> I say, uh, now there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, uh, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. Uh, it increased my fury as the beating of a drum increases the courage of a soldier. Louder and louder every instant. 
the old man's terror must have been extreme. It was louder, I say, louder. Uh, every moment, uh, I told you I'm nervous, uh, so I am. Uh, and now, uh, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this, uh, it excited me to uncontrollable terror. And yet, for many minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the noise, increased. Uh, and now a new anxiety seized me. The noise would be heard by a neighbor. <laughs> the, the old man's hour had come. I leapt into the room. He shrieked once, once only. I dragged him from the bed and, uh, and pulled it over him. I, uh, uh, I, I then smiled gaily uh, to find the deed so far done. Um, but for many minutes, the heart beat on with a, with a muffled sound. Uh, this, however, did not uh, vex me. Uh, uh, it would not be heard through the walls. In time, it ceased. <laughs> and uh, the old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. <laughs> Yes, he was, he was stone, stone dead. Uh, I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. Uh, he was stone dead. His eye would bother me no more. Uh, if still you think that, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. <laughs> no. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. And then I uh, took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and uh, <clears throat> deposited all between uh, the scantlings. <laughs> then I replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, uh, that uh, no human eye, not even his, <laughs> could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out. Uh, no uh, stain what of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. <laughs> I was too wary for that. <laughs> uh, a tub had caught all. <laughs> uh, when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, uh, still dark as midnight. As the bell struck the hour, um, there came a knocking at the street door. And I, I went down to open it with a light heart. Oh, what did I have to fear? There entered the three men who introduced themselves as uh, officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Uh, suspicion of foul play had been aroused, and they had been deputed to search the premises. <laughs> I, I smiled. Oh, what did I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The scream, I said, had been my own in a dream. Uh, I, the old man I mentioned was uh, absent in the country. Uh, I took my visitors all over the house. I, I bid them uh, search, search well. And I led them at length to his chamber. Uh, I showed him uh, his treasures, all undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I had chairs brought into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while mm -hmm. I myself, in the wild uh, audacity of my triumph, uh, placed my own seat upon the very spot where the 
beneath which repose the corpse of the victim. <laughs> the, uh, the officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was uh, singularly at ease. Uh, they sat, and uh, while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But uh, ere long, I felt myself getting pale and uh, wished them gone. Uh, my head ached, and uh, I fancied a ringing in my ears. But, but still they sat, still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. I talked more freely uh, to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness. Until at length, I found the sound was not within my ears. I, no doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and in a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased. And, uh, and what could I do? It, it was a low, dull sound, uh, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I, I gasped for breath. Uh, and yet the officers had it not. I talked more quickly and more vehemently, and yet the sound increased. I, I arose and argued around trifles in a vile, uh, in a high key, uh, with violent gesticulations, and yet the sound steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But still the sound increased. <laughs> oh, what could I do? I, I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung my chair and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose above all. And it's continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And, and still, the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Oh, was it possible they heard it not? Uh, uh, almighty God, no, no. Uh, they heard. Uh, they suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. Better than, than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear their hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt I must scream on the eye. And now again, hark oh, louder, 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 louder. <laughs> Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It, it is a beating of his hideous heart. <laughs> lighthearted break after that. <laughs> um, so folks, please welcome Pip Chamberlain with his Halloween humor. Happy Halloween. By show of hands, how many audience members have a family member who is a witch? <laughs> now, come on. Have some courage. Raise those hands. How many of you have a witch who's a family member? <laughs> Confirmed, I suspected. I get it, I get it. You all thought I uttered that naughty word which rhymes with fritch. Anyway, what's the problem with twin witches? You never know which witch is which. <laughs> what happens of a witch breaks her broomstick. She witch hates! <laughs> what do 
do you call two witches that live together? Roommates! <laughs> what do you call, what, what does the witch do when she style, how does the witch style her hair? She uses scare spray! <laughs> Where do ghosts like to vacation? Exchange love letters, how do they do it? They use the ghost office. <laughs> if the if the aggravated ghost mummy says to it at her toddlers as she gets into her car, what does she say? Fasten your sheet belts. <laughs> Why did the ghost starch his sheet? He wanted to hear my skirt stiff! <laughs> what is the favorite stage play of a ghoul? It's a classic, 400 years old. Romeo and Juliet! <laughs> Why do mummies have no friends? Because they're too wrapped up into themselves! <laughs> <laughs> but why are mummies afraid to take time off from work? They're afraid to unwind. <laughs> what do you get when you cross a vampire with a snowman? Frostbite! <laughs> What's problematic about kissing a vampire? They're a dang pain in the neck! <laughs> Why can't skeletons play church music? They don't have any organs! <laughs> Why? Skeleton. Why can't werewolves tell time? Because they're not werewolves. <laughs> what do you call a romantic comedy where zombies find true love? A zomcom. <laughs> What did the pumpkin say when he first met his carver? Cut me out! <laughs> and finally, because I know all of you want this to end as much as I want this to end. <laughs> How do you make pumpkins big and stronger? By pumpkin iron, baby! <laughs> are from the Broadway musical Jekyll and Hyde. Emma finds Jekyll's diary in his lab. Uh, before she can read far enough to find out that he has also become Mr. Hyde, Jekyll finds her and closes the journal. What follows is the song Once Upon a Dream, which the lovely Laura de Brunner will perform next. That will be followed by In His Eyes, where Lucy and Emma have both fallen in love with Jekyll. In this gorgeous duet, they separately and simultaneously express their deep but confused feelings for the man they both love. That will be performed by Bailey Noel and Laura de Brunner. <laughs>
sit and watch the rain and see my tears run down the window pane. I sit and watch the sky and I can hear it breathe a sigh. I think of him, how we were, and when I think of him, then I remember. First published in January 1845, the poem, The Raven. Noted for its supernatural atmosphere, it tells the tale of a talking raven's mysterious visit to a distraught lover, tracing the man's slow descent into madness. As we hear him talk to us of Pallas, he is hinting at Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. As we hear the raven, I will let you draw your own conclusions about our narrator's faculties. It is important to note that the Raven narrator, narrator's grief-driven descent into madness precedes the death of Poe's beloved Virginia just a few years later, 
and may have been inspired by the illness that ultimately took her from him. Once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, there came a rapping, a rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, I distinctly remember it was in bleak December, as each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books, so cease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden, who the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken satin, and certain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with the fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still my beating heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor intriguing entrance of my chamber door, "'tis some late visitor entreating entrance of my chamber door. "'This it is, and nothing more. "'Presently my stroll, soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, or madam, Truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping in my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, I stood, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, with all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely this is something that my window lattice, let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore, let my heart be still a moment. And this mystery explore, tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, then with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a moment stopped or stayed he, but with mean of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sat fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance of war, through Though thy crescent shorn and shaven thou, art no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the nice Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. <laughs> Much I marvel this ungainly fowl to hear this horse so plainly through its, though its answer little meaning and relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever was blessed with seeing a bird above his chamber door, door bird or beast sculpted on the sculpture bust above his chamber door with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word as if his soul and that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as, his hope, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by his so reply so aptly spoken, doubtless said I, what it utters is only its stock in store, caught from some unhappy master who's a merciful disaster, followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope, that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushion seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to thinking, fancy into fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at easy reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the left light floated over, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight, lamplight glowing o'er, she shall press nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from some unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. 
Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee by the angels he has sent thee. Respite, respite, and nepenthe, nepenthe from thy memories of the Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs> prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, bird or devil, whether tempter set or temptest trod, tossed a crop for thee here from ashore, desolate yet undaunted on this desert length, enchanted on this home of thy horror haunted. Tell me truly, I implore. Is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs> prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet, still a bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within that distant Aiden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign and purding, bird, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my chamber door. Take thy beak from out my heart. Take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, Still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming, and all the lamplight o'er streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow lies floating on the floor, shall be lifted. Nevermore. that through no fault of our own, a very powerful witch has experienced a bit of misfortune. Um, and is, it is with a somber heart that our next performer delivers this news for you all. Please put your hands together for Diane Shoemaker.
Jeez. Why does it have to taste so good and hurt so bad? I guess it's uh, time to do something I've been putting off for a while. So I'm gonna go make a dentist appointment, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, while I do that, will you guys please enjoy our next performer, Carter Brown, singing, oh look, dentist. <laughs> it's almost like this was all a written transition sequence. <laughs> I was younger, just a bad little kid. My mama noticed funny things I did. Like shooting puppies with a BB gun. Got boys and guppies, and when I was done, I'd find a pussycat and bash his head. That's when my mama said, What could she say? She said, My boy, I think someday you'll find a way to make a natural tendency. You'll be a dentist. You have a talent for causing things pain. Son, be a dentist. People will pay you to be inhumane. If your temperament's wrong, to the priesthood. And teaching will suit you still less. Son, be a dentist. You'll be a success. singing a chilling take on the classic 1930s love song Zing Went the Strings of My Heart, arrangement and accompaniment by Phyllis Wycliffe. <laughs>
garlic. <laughs> I'm out at home. Uh, he's got one eye. He's got one horn. He flies. He's purple. He eats people. I didn't say his name, but he popped into your head, didn't he? Uh, please welcome to the stage Mary Ann. Black 
Number. We just wanted to give some thank yous to some people who have helped us with this performance. Our first one is to the Monroe County Public Library for allowing us to use this space for free. Um, we also would like to thank the Monroe County Civic Theater Board and members at large who allowed us to do this production. We would like to thank Janet and Steve Heiss who helped with materials. We would like to thank Spectrum Printing. They are a sponsor for our theater community. We'd also like to thank Community Access TV. They're actually here from the library. They recorded this for us, and they are the library's TV channel, which is really exciting. <laughs> uh, I also like to thank Kenny Hurtling, who created the program that you all have, um, Phyllis Wycliffe, who was our accompanist. Uh, we have Marianne Iria, who did publicity. She also did some choreography um, for part of the number that you're going to see next. Uh, we have Bill Godiva, who helped with sound, Jason Lopez, who is our producer. We have Hannah Bowman, who is our amazing stage manager. Uh, we also have Bailey Noel, who is our assistant director. She's been great. I always loved working with Bailey, and I'm really happy that she's been part of this team. And then I'd like to thank you all for coming and our wonderful cast. So our next number is Ghostbusters, and it's going to feature Carter Brown, Pip Chamberlain, and Marianne Iria. And there may be some audience participation in it and some surprises. So we hope you enjoy it. <laughs>
to our wonderful cast. It was just, they're amazing. <laughs> so thank you for coming to our performance. I'm going to go ahead and just label off in order of appearance um, our cast, if you just want to give them a round of applause when I say their name. We have Grace Gung. We have Bailey Noel. We have Dakota Paris. We have Kenny Hurtling, who had to leave early, but Kenny Hurtling, who did the for us our end. We have Roy Sillings. Kit Chamberlain. Wycliffe as her accompanist. Thanks again for coming to our performance. If you ever want to be a part of Monroe County Civic Theater, you can find us on Facebook. We also have a website. And thanks again for coming. We enjoyed having you.